Hello, friends. My name is Lucretia Mott, and my family has just introduced me to YouTube. They said that anyone in the world would be able to view my video, which is another thing I'm thoroughly impressed of with this age. It is simply astonishing how much our country has advanced after the end of the atrocious institution of slavery. To commence. My name is Lucretia Coffin Mott, and I was born to James and Anna Coffin in January 3rd. 1793 on the lovely island of Nantucket, Massachusetts. You ought to know that the island is only 15 miles long. During my childhood, my father would often be absent because he was a captain of a whaling ship. While he would be away um, whaling, my mother, Anna would run our shop very well, bringing in um, a good amount of money for our family. The Lord, he blessed me. My whole family was actually a Quaker family. The Quakers believe that both sexes are equal. In our services, which are unique to other denominations, anyone, including women, can speak as the Lord leads. Because of the belief in the equality of the sexes, my parents encouraged educational, which is represented by a little apple, and the spiritual development of all their children, including me. At age 13, my parents sent me to a Quaker boarding school named Nine Partners. The There, I excelled in my studies, getting some A pluses, and I was even able to become an assistant teacher. A fellow assistant teacher, his name was James Mott. I have to admit, he was quite handsome. He was also strongly against slavery, just as I had become at the boarding school. Although I love school, I must remind you that I grew up so thoroughly imbued with women's rights that it was the most important question of my life from a very early day. And this, as you can see, is me angry at when I was made aware that the male teachers were actually paid more than the female teachers at this Quaker boarding school, Nine Partners. After I graduated, my family moved to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1809. I was able to convince James to become my father's partner. Great plan, right? And here's a little uh, sketch of Independence Hall in Philadelphia. So cool to be near such wonderful history. And then two years later, after we had moved to Philadelphia... And James had been working with my father. In 1811, James and I were married. Living with James was truly wonderful. We both attended numerous anti-slavery conventions and conferences and meetings. We were also very, very good friends with Garrison. William Garrison, the abolitionist. Here are some uh, chains to represent slavery, that we did not like slavery. And, uh, in fact, we were very much against it. We were very active in those um, slavery conventions and all the anti-slavery circles. And here's a primitive sketch of William Garrison. And now that the terrible war is over, I can tell you that our house was actually an underground railroad stop, which it was amazing. And at the same time, I'm so grateful to God for keeping all these people that passed through our home safe. Learning about slavery and coming into contact with runaways led me to truly abhor that institution. In fact, in around 1825, I felt the Lord leading me to abandon both sugar and cotton, which were slave products. So I was not able to use them in any sweets or clothing. We always had to refer to alternative methods. Now, don't think that I just followed my beloved beloved James everywhere. I, too, had an opinion about everything. In fact, so much an opinion that some abolitionists thought that it hurt our cause, which is pretty crazy. I cannot believe it. But, yes, here's me um, 
and uh, speaking when then and then uh, many male abolitionists did not like that I spoke up and had my own opinions. In 1833, I realized that women needed an outlet to fight again directly against slavery. So myself and some other ladies founded the an- the female anti slavery society in. 1833 and let me tell you there were many who were not delighted those same people who did not like when I voiced my opinions in fact a mob burned down Pennsylvania Hall where we were having one of our meetings in 1838 their final intention was to burn down my own house but thanks to the protection of the Lord and our friends our house was actually spared In my early 20s, I actually became a Quaker minister because uh, the Quakers believed that women could also be ministers. So therefore, I had some practice speaking in public, which helped me in the 1830s when I spoke all over, including mixed audiences. So mixed audiences is both speaking to both men and women, which was a very controversial at the time. And so throughout my life, I spoke on many different um, causes. Um, But not just the slavery issue I spoke uh, about against slavery, temperance, pacifism, religious freedom, prison reform, and a fair treatment of Native Americans. And I was also honored in some of these uh, speeches to be able to share the stage with um, wonderful people such as Sojourner Truth. In 1840, the World Anti-Slavery Convention was occurring in London. My husband was going to be a delegate. So I all decided to also become a delegate. Many people had opinions about these decisions. These men are representing the people who were not so happy with my decision. In fact, including an editor of a Pittsburgh abolitionist newspaper who said, We know this lady well, and for her kindness and hospitality, benevolence, and purity of life, she has no superior. But we should not be surprised if she should so far forget the true dignity of a womanhood in her intractable zeal for what she terms principle and to attempt to take her seat as a delegate in the world's anti-slavery convention. In spite of this opposition, I traveled. And upon arriving on the convention, they refused to seat the women delegates, which is shown to the left, of which I was not the only one. I wrote in my diary of the trip, even Prescott of Jamaica, who was colored, thought it would lower the dignity of the convention to bring ridicule on the whole thing if ladies were admitted. In response, he was told that similar reasons were urged in Philadelphia for the exclusion of colored people from our anti-slavery society meetings. Later, I recorded, we were kindly admitted behind the bar. And conducted to our seats, as this man represents us conducting to our seats. But we were not able to participate in the convention, unfortunately. One of the other women delegates who was not seated um, was Elizabeth Caddy Stanton. Yes, you guys all might be familiar with her. Uh, She was a, a women's rights activist, but it all started here at the convention. She and I resolved a terrible disrespect that at the at the convention that we needed not just to fight for the liberation of the slave but we also needed to fight for the liberation of women from their bondage so quote thus as stanton states in the history of women's suffrage a missionary work for emancipation was then and there inaugurated out of this missionary work was born the seneca falls women's rights convention of 1848 It would be an understatement to say that there was opposition to the convention. In spite of it, we still persevered. Advertisements were placed all around Seneca Falls, inviting only women to the first day and then both men and women to the second. There are two honors which stick out from those days. Yes, and then here are the two um, advertisements, and I was actually... uh, uh, I was actually named as a speaker in those advertisements. So the two honors that stick out from those two days, those the first that I helped write and draft the Declaration of the Sentiments, and later that I was the first to sign it, which was truly an honor. So that you may become familiar with the document, the following is one of the last paragraphs of the Declaration of Sentiments. 
Now in view, it starts with quote, now in view of this entire disenfranchisement of one half of the people of this country, their social and religious degradation, in view of the unjust laws above mentioned, because women do not feel themselves aggrieved, do feel themselves aggrieved, oppressed, fraudulently deprived of their most sacred rights, we insist that they have immediate admission to all the rights of then privileged which belong to them as citizens of the United States. And then now this is, um, in addition to the declaration of sentiments, I also published a speech named The Discourse on Women in 1849. In this discourse, I argued for equal rights, including suffrage, equal education, which would help stay-at-home mothers to be well-versed in medicine and the likes, and equal moral responsibility and equality in marriage. Now, moral responsibility was important because um, many times we were thought of as, you know, little pets that, oh, yes, all the responsibility went to the men. So if we did something wrong, it was actually the man's responsibility. And in addition, in the introduction, I argued for the equality of women through scripture. One of the main arguments that needed reproof, though, was that if a man, well, uh, if a married woman was given her rights and exercised her duties, the family would fall apart. But I believe that if you take my life an example, as my autobiography says, my domestic sphere has passed much like that of other wives and mothers in this country. I have six children, not accustomed to resigning them to the care of a nurse. I was much confined to them during their infancy and youth. And quote, in the discourse towards the end, I also remind the audience that in a true marriage relationship, the independence of the husband and wife is equal, their dependence mutual, and their obligations reciprocal. Finally, I know many of you were curious about my views on the civil war which I lived through. Quote, the cause of peace has my, had my share of efforts taking the ultra non-resistance ground. That Christianity cannot be upheld and actively supported. A government based on the sword or whose ultimate resort is to destroying weapons. I deeply dislike the civil war, but I guess that as we know, God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. From um this is this is a verse from Romans eight twenty eight. The slaves were freed, which is something my family had been fighting for for a very long time. Although, as I mentioned above, I am overjoyed that slavery is abolished, I do not support the 15th Amendment, for it does not include women's enfranchisement. The 15th Amendment um, is the enfranchisement of all pe uh, people, no matter their color. All men, I should say, no matter their color. Presently, I am still fighting for equal rights for women, but I also desire to raise up a new generation of women who will fight for their rights because they have been thoroughly educated. Educated. For these reasons, I have helped establish the Swarthmore College and the School of Design for Women, which I hear is now called the Moore College of Art. And I also have helped establish the Women's Hospital. Before I leave, I would like to share a fun fact about me. In 1849, I received five out of the 85 votes for the vice presidential nomination for the Liberty Party. It was a and it was a pleasure to share my life through primitive art with you today. Thank you very much. Epilogue. Lucretia Mott continued to fight for women's rights until the very end. She herself says, quote, it is always good to be zealously affected in a good thing. She passed away surrounded by her family on November 11, 1880. Despite her tireless efforts, women were not granted the right to vote until 1920. Lucretia Mott is currently memorialized along with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony in the U.S. Capitol.